Have you ever run across somebody who knows the right thing to do, but they do the right thing wrong? That's wrong, right? There's only one way to do work. Do the right thing right, right? Have you ever run across these people who do the wrong thing right? It's as wrong as doing the right thing wrong, right? Because there's only one way to do work, and that's to do the right thing right, right? Can you imagine the fourth group? These people can't do the wrong thing right. They do the wrong thing wrong. You don't want to hire these people. Now, this is going to be wrong, and I think you could agree with me. But this guy can't do the wrong thing right. He's going to do the wrong thing wrong. Doing the wrong thing wrong is wrong, right? Well, it's as wrong as doing the right thing wrong, right? There's only one way to do work. It's the standard by which we live. Buildings should perform. So doing the right thing right is right, right? Right. kitchen cabinets, a lazy Susan, so that you can spin it around and get the stuff in the wasted space, correct? Well, when you take a look at this one, there's ducks inside the lazy Susan. This would like be doing the wrong thing wrong, right? Ducks are in the lazy Susan. Craftsmanship, fit for use? I don't think so. This was work done with no performance. We can't tolerate that. Work done in buildings with no performance has to become unacceptable. Again, this is the USS Montana requesting that you immediately divert your course 15 degrees to the north to avoid a collision. Over. Please divert your course 15 degrees to the south to avoid collision. This is Captain Hancock. You will divert your course. Over. Negative, Captain. I'm not moving anything. Change your course. Over. So, this is the USS Montana, the second largest vessel in the North Atlantic Fleet. You will change course 15 degrees north, or I will be forced to take measures to ensure the safety of this ship. Over! This is a lighthouse, mate. It's your call. This is a lighthouse, mate. It's your call. So each of us has a decision to make, you know what I mean? Are we going to get on the course and stay there or not? If we take a glance at the great building performance inquiry which took place in about 1978 to about 1992, there was no organization, there was no home performance industry, these were just people who rose up out of an energy crisis and an oil embargo, and the interest rates were 16%, and these people drove, rose up individually and began to talk and communicate. The gathering place was the Affordable Comfort Conference, and then we'd go back out into the land. And I took a few of these names, which many of you know quite well. They were focused on how do buildings perform, 1978 to 1992. Great people with a task and a catalyst that had driven them, an energy crisis. The French Revolution, World War I, World War II, the first oil embargo, 
all were catalysts for how we do work. These people, I hallowed these people. They affected my life. I've never been the same. Regionally, you have the same kind of people that you should think about in your mind because we've got to build an army. Rob DeSoto, Tom Downey, Linda Wigington, George Songus, John Proctor, Michael Blasnick, Neil Moyer, Jim Fitzgerald, Joe Stebrick, Terry Brennan, Ken Gadsby, Larry Palmiter, Bruce Davis, Gary Nelson, Gautam Dutt, and Rob DeKiefer were instrumental in my life to hold up a standard that said buildings must perform. And we spent a serious amount of time trying to figure out how to make them perform. I suggest that you all go back home and go to a used bookstore and you buy the February uh, 1981 issue. It's the only National Geographic that's read. Page 48 and 49 changed my life. Here's a picture of Ken Gadsby and Gautam, Gautam Dutt. On page 48 and 49, it's talking about the godfathers of house doctoring. Ken Gadsby and Gautam Dutt. Using blower doors and infrared cameras. They were way before their time. They are the ones who led us, these two men, led us in the pursuit of bypass sealing. I remember the day that Gautam Dutt was in an attic with me in Florida and saw for the first time in his, in his career mechanically driven bypasses where we were sucking and blowing like nobody's business. And so this is a great, these are two great people who led the charge. I want you to take just a moment and look at this chart and figure out how old you'll be in 2030. If you couldn't hear up in the front, some, somebody said, I'll be gone. I kind of looked at the chart and said, I'm not there. <laughs> but I want you to take a look at this because it's really important to think about the future and how old will I be when we get to these mileposts. The uh, architecture, uh, Ar AIA, uh, you can go on the web and do 2030 challenge and you'll find out that there, the industrial and commercial and residential buildings represent currently right now about 3 billion square feet. In the next 30 years, we'll have demol demolition on 52 billion square feet. We will remodel and, re -re and retrofit 150 billion of those square feet. And in the same period of time, we'll build another 150 billion square feet. So there's 300 billion in retrofit and new construction between now and 2030. Do they need to perform? Every single one. We need an army. If you look at the sectors thinking this way and take residential, commercial, and industrial, you end up with 48% of all the energy use in this nation is in buildings. That means that we're sitting with the opportunity of a lifetime, an opportunity to strengthen our, com our country. You already know the building industry is in deep trouble. I was at the International Builder Show, and it's predicted by NHB that if we make 400,000 houses this year, it will be a surprise. So it'll be one of the worst years in new construction in the history of construction. And it'll take decades to get the, the value back because in 1950, when you invested $100 in a house, you could get $100 back. By, 19, or by 2006, that $100, you could get $191 back. By two years passing, it drops to 145. It will take decades to recover. 